Okay, thank you. Uh, I, so uh, I'm, I guess, fairly recent uh, addition to, uh, to USC. So I'm hopeful to uh, at least share some of the um, research I've uh, done with some of the collaborators and you know, hopefully I'll have uh, many more collaborators uh, here. Um, so this uh, was done in uh, collaboration with uh, some students. So really the students did the work. I'm here to do the lip service. Uh, so Catherine is a uh, student at UIUC in uh, CS department. Um, she was uh, she is advised by Sami Kueja, who um, who is now at Stanford, and Boshin Zhao is my student at uh, Chicago. And so what I'll tell you is some of work we've done on functional data analysis, uh, and the paper just recently got accepted into uh, into JASA. Um, okay, so the big picture that. Uh, that is happening, I guess, in, in many different sciences is that uh, uh, we are collecting more and more uh, data. For instance, uh, we have a like, this uh, illustration of human body and we can collect, and not we can, but we do collect quite a lot of different measurements about this uh, human body. We can sequence uh, one's genome, we can uh, sequence one's uh, microbiome, uh, we can perform CT scan or MRI scan, and we can integrate all of this uh, data to form some biomarkers that would potentially under help us understand one's body, or potentially we could understand if one's body uh, system changes and maybe some personalized treatment need to be uh, conducted on, uh, on such an uh, individual. Similarly, we have, uh, say, single cell uh, data, and we can not only just measure the sequence, genetic sequence um, for, for that cell, we can measure the protein abundances, we can measure thing, proteins that are on the surface of the cell. So not just kind of one measurement about a single cell, but a variety of different techniques that uh, are readily available to understand uh, one cell. And so as a statistician, um, I'm interested in maybe building a model that combines <coughs> Uh, these various measurements um, to aid somehow scientific discovery. That's a really goal uh, that we would like to pursue. Now, uh, one of these uh, systems in, in human body that uh, scientists are interested in uh, is a network. And uh, uh, you know, here is an illustration from some textbook on how the brain looks like so you have these uh, neurons they're connected to each other and signal propagates uh, through these connections and as, as uh, the neurons uh, fire. And uh, what uh, we would like to do is, uh, what we do is we collect measurements from, from this brain. So we cannot really understand at the structural level, at least not at the whole brain, how neurons are connected to each other, but we can, more or less cheaply collect information uh, from the brain. For instance, uh, you may collect functional MRI images, so you might collect uh, uh, neural uh, spike train data. And uh, what uh, the goal of statistics or machine learning would be is to somehow understand uh, these data to develop a uh, model of, uh, of a brain we'll call it, say, a functional brain network. And why is this useful? Well, maybe down the road, we will be able to develop some uh, uh, preventative care. We might better understand uh, mental diseases, how they progress, how we could potentially prevent that progression, and, and so forth. Um, and so largely, what uh, scientists in, in this area are interested in is uh, trying to uncover what we are going to refer to as functional connectivity or effective connectivity. So the term structural connectivity refers to uh, how neurons are connected to each other. And so that we can understand in a very small part of the brain, but uh, not at a whole brain. Whereas functional connectivity uh, typically refers to say uh, how regions of brain, so each region encompasses activity of multiple neurons, how they are uh, correlated with each other or how they are associated with each other. So think about either correlation or partial correlation as a measure of uh, dependence between different parts 
of the brain and functional connectivity represents those objects, either partial correlation, correlation, or some other notion of co-dependence. And of course, uh, going forward, uh, scientists are maybe even more interested in understanding effective connectivity, not just associations between different uh, regions, but uh, how you know, changes in one region affect uh, processing information uh, in, in another uh, region. That and, causal? So that could, you can think of it as a, as a causal representation of the model. That's really what uh, we, want. we want to have some uh, structural understanding of the, of the data that we collect. And so largely what today's talk will be is how can we uh, reconstruct functional connectivity. So we will, I'll define what I'm going to try to recover from the data that we have. And the focus will be on this uh, understanding of associations between the measurements that we collect. Okay, so um, you know, one a specific application that motivated um, this paper was uh, to better understand uh, data where simultaneously one collects EEG measurements and fMRI measurements on a particular individual. So typically you can envision uh, an individual that has some electrodes on, on their brain and together with those electrodes, they are moved into uh, MRI machine and one simultaneously collects fMRI images and uh, EEG data on that subject. Um, and so these technologies um, provide information at different uh, scales. So you can think of uh, fMRI, it's a um, technology that gives us quite a good uh, spatial resolution, but a temporal resolution is not, uh, is not very good. So essentially what fMRI measures is how the oxygen enters the, the, the cell. And that uh, is the result of some brain activity. So it might take a few seconds for the oxygen level um, to change in, in the cell. Whereas EEG data uh, records changes in electric activity, and those are much faster. But at the same time, the spatial resolution from that one obtains from EEG data is uh, is much less. So, uh, kind of the goal of the analysis, so the goal of why people are collecting these data is they're hopeful that uh, EEG might provide information on when the processes uh, start to happen and fMRI can then maybe localize uh, uh, that information. Yeah. So, you know, th this is just a pictorial representation. We have uh, some number of electrodes, maybe think about 100 roughly electrodes and they're collecting time series that are very densely sampled uh, from each one of the, the electrodes and uh, fMRI uh, data, again, you have you know, different parts of the brain and one is collecting, again, time series, but now they are much more coarsely sampled along the uh, temporal uh, direction. And so we would like to use this data that looks something like this to infer uh, functional connectivity underlying the data generating process. And somehow, uh, you know, the the challenge of today's talk will be how can we, you know, maybe think about integrating these two uh, modalities together. And I'll tell you one way of how we did integrate the data, but there are probably many other approaches that one can uh, use to uh, study this data and uh, uh, kind of like open to hearing suggestions that uh, people might have. Okay, so given that I'm standing here and I'm giving a talk, the, the tool of choice to, to study this data are going to be probabilistic uh, graphical models. So in order to um, kind of put us all on the same page, I'll just give you a few slides of, uh, of introduction of what these tools uh, represent. So the way I think about probabilistic graphical models is that it's a, uh, a parsimonious representation of some probability distribution. So Mark, this probabilistic graphical model consists of two components. There's a random vector. You can going to use this uh, random vector as a representation for the data that we collect. Uh, and then there's an associated graph with um, this uh, random vector. And so the, the graph will have p vertices, just as how many components the random vector x has. 
so each vertex corresponds to one coordinate of your of your random vector, and the edge set will tell you something about the underlying conditional independences. And so, and the way people in, in the science would use this representation is that they would explore the associations between these measurement variables. So the edge set will tell you something about the associations between these uh, statistics. So more formally, uh, if an edge is not present in the uh, edge set, it uh, is equivalent to saying that the two uh, coordinates of this random vector are going to be conditionally independent given all the other uh, coordinates. So this random vector X is going to be Markov with respect to the graph G. That's uh, uh, just a parsimonious representation of some uh, conditional independences. And so here is an example. We have a uh, graph with six vertices and we see that there is a no edge between X1 between vertex one and vertex six. And what this implies is that X one and X six are conditionally independent uh, given all the other uh, vertices. Now, you know, let's look at one concrete example uh, that people often use because it's mathematically easy to work with. Uh, Gaussian graphical models is, is one, one such example. Uh, so here the distribution of this vector X would be parameterized by the first two moments. So we have a mean and, and variance, and it's in some sense, it's very easy to, to work with. And even more nicely is the property that the inverse of the covariance matrix, people call it uh, precision matrix, uh, it encodes structural assumptions of the, of the graph. So in particular, the pattern of non-zero elements. So the stars here represent all the non-zero elements of the precision matrix, but importantly, the, the zeros uh, here tell you what variables are conditionally independent or not. So simply by looking at the inverse of the covariance matrix, we may observe that uh, X1 and X6, for example, are conditionally independent given everything uh, uh, else. So directly from the parameterization, we can read off the um, dependent structure. And one, one of the tasks that uh, people study in the literature on probabilistic graphical models, uh, this would be say one topic if one teaches a graduate level course on this, would be how do we learn the structure of the graph if we have n ID samples from some distribution? And so this was uh, uh, proposed by Dempster in the, I believe, 80s. Uh, it was uh, a question was asked, like, you know, how can we learn a structure of a graphical model? where there are certain zeros in the precision matrix. So one assumes that the family of distribution is Gaussian. And uh, the question is how can we you know, learn the structure given n ID samples from uh, such Gaussian uh, distribution. And then in the last say 15 years, there was uh, really a lot of uh, effort on how can we uh, develop both statistical properties of different estimation procedures, as well as how we can compute them very quickly on a computer. Uh, and these were developed for various distribution families, uh, for example, ex exponential family distributions, Ising model, various specific forms of non-parametric uh, distributions. And the questions that people typically ask is, you know, how many samples uh, do we need from some distribution to recover the graph structure proper? Uh, consistently with, or with high probability. Um, some people have, uh, for example, Xiaohui has worked on problems where the data are not ID, but maybe comes from a certain temporal process. Um, and then again, the question might be like, how well can we recover the, uh, the underlying uh, graph? Now, the specific kind of algorithm that uh, I'm going to briefly mention now uh, is that something that we will be uh, using later. And it's a uh, neighborhood selection algorithm. So this was uh, developed by uh, Meinhausen and Buhlmann in uh, 2006. It is a procedure where one learns the structure of the graphical model by a sequence of uh, regression uh, procedures. So in particular, when we have Gaussian data, one can... Uh, run a regression or look at conditional expectation of one vertex given all the others. And from 
the regression coefficients and, and this uh, conditional expectation, one can read off the parameters of, uh, of the graph. And so procedurally, the way this will work, again, like most recent kind of efforts were focused on high dimensional problems where number of sample size, numbers of samples is smaller than the number of parameters. One would try to maximize the node conditional likelihood of uh, one vertex given the others and add a penalty that somehow biases the solutions of this optimization problems to be uh, sparse. So in the context of Gaussian distribution, this likelihood would be just a uh, mean squared loss. So it would be normal the residual squared uh, when we are regressing one vertex onto all the others. So pictorially, we would, let's say pick variable x1, we would regress it onto variables x2 through x8. We have n samples from some distribution. We will choose solve this optimization problem. Some of these variables will be non-zero. Some of them will be zeros. And this tells us something about the local uh, Markov blanket of this graph. And we can repeat that procedure then for all the vertices kind of sequentially. And eventually, we would recover a graph. And under some conditions, this consistently recovers the uh, conditional independence assumptions underlying the data generating process. Okay, so uh, this is the algorithm that we will leverage uh, later on. Uh, it doesn't really, it's not specific to the Gaussian distribution. One can, under some conditions, also look at node conditional uh, distributions when things are coming from uh, exponential family distributions, and that also has been studied in the in the literature. Okay, so so far what I've told you is essentially a setting where we get n samples from some multivariate vector, and this is one procedure that allows us to learn Markov graph underlying the distribution. When for each vertex we have a scalar random variable. Now. Uh, Recently, people have been interested in understanding uh, you know, functions, and in particular, thinking about dependencies between uh, different functions. So this is a uh, work that was done here at uh, actually USC. So Chiao was uh, a student at uh, uh, Marshall, advised by Garrett, uh, uh, and uh, they developed a functional data graphical models, which can be thought of as a extension of Gaussian graphical model to, to functional uh, data. And so this is a picture taken from their paper. Um, the data that uh, you might uh, observe are these um, uh, green uh, kind of like uh, squares, okay? So th this, they suppose like, let's say that when you put um, a person into a uh, MRI machine, for, for each kind of region of the brain, what you're collecting is a uh, kind of a measurement of a continuous stochastic process. Okay, so the red curve is some idealized, uh, say, curve that you don't get to see. But uh, if you could measure it, there exists some continuous process that uh, is produced by one walk cell in your, in your brain. But what you end up getting, uh, seeing is some noisy uh, version of this red curve and it's uh, discreetly sampled. So you don't get to see it over continuous time, but over some discrete grid. So, so the, each row is a subject and each column is a uh, region? So, correct. So so this would be, uh, let's say, Xiaohui's uh, MRI measurements. This would be maybe Jacob's uh, measurements. Uh, these are Larry's measurements and, and so forth. And so each column corresponds to kind of like one region of the uh, brain. So in fMRI setting, you can think of like you're measuring kind of tens of thousands of these. And then after processing the data, maybe you would have uh, 100 or 200 regions of interest. Um, again, that uh, can be summarized something like this. So the functions here could be realized from some Gaussian process or it's a... This is what is assumed here. Okay. And, and we are going to work with this. So we, we really assume existence of a uh, multivariate Gaussian process. 
And what you get to see is some discretized noisy version of that uh, process. And what we would like to learn from these noisy discretized version of the multivariate Gaussian process are conditional uh, dependencies underlying uh, these processes. So again, just like in the uh, scalar setting, an edge or ex missingness of an edge, if the edge is not present in the edge set, that would imply that you know, this curve, uh, X7 curve and X8 curve are conditionally independent given everything uh, else. This is kind of like the, the object that they are after. Okay, so more formally, um, we have a multivariate Gaussian process. Uh, we'll assume that it's mean zero uh, and it's observed in some common domain T, let's say zero to one. Okay, and so this multivariate Gaussian process, we have P coordinates and we'll uh, observe this over N individuals. The object of interest in, in this case would be a conditional cross covariance function. So it's a uh, object, it's a bivariate maybe function if you wish, uh, where we have two time points S and T, and we're looking at uh, covariance between Xij valued at time point S, Xij, Xil at time point T, given all the other curves. And uh, then these two random functions are conditionally independent given all the other random functions if this is identical to, to zero. That's kind of uh, the generalization of a uh, vector case. Um, and then we can think of the graph corresponding to this multivariate process would be pairs of vertices for which this uh, conditional cross covariance function is uh, not zero. So just like in the Gaussian setting, if the element of the precision matrix is uh, different from zero, then they're conditionally dependent. And here um, we're looking at the norm of uh, the Schmidt norm of this, uh, this operator. Okay, so that's kind of like mathematically what we would like to, to do. Of course, uh, when we run this on a computer, we cannot really work with uh, infinite dimensional uh, objects. So typical uh, thing that people do in functional data analysis is that they somehow perform uh, dimensionality reduction so that things can be run on a computer. And uh, here, what uh, typically one does is performs functional principal component analysis. So one looks at certain um, normal functions, say eigenfunctions of, uh, of this uh, covariance operator. And we will um, form a low dimensional represent approximation of this object by looking at this finite dimensional representation. Okay, so uh, if I give you these uh, basis functions, one can project Xij onto these bases. Um, this gives us these uh, scores or, um, and then we can use these scores to approximate this infinite dimensional object with the first M uh, components. Okay, and so um, I, I'm not going to go into details what uh, they did in this paper, but you can imagine that uh, once I've reduced this from infinite dimensional space to kind of a vector, space, I can think about conditional independence between these vectors. And under suitable assumptions, uh, the thing that they can recover in this finite dimensional space will imply something about the infinite dimensional space. This is going to be through an assumption. Yeah. In, in their work and in yours, do you care about the domain being one dimensional or it can be like T, can it be? Um, a general, like, can I think about spatial problems equally well, or should I only be thinking about time? I think from now, we, we thought of time only because it was specific to, to this application, but um, I think that things would be quite more challenging if you consider spatial data as well.
I'm not sure. I I, I have not uh, thought about it. I think it's a it's a good question, and some I know people have thought about it, but maybe not in the specific setting where you have multivariate functions that you observe. So somehow you you're observing this spatial temporal process, but you don't have kind of dependence between multiple spatial temporal processes. Yeah, I'm not even sure. Like, are there are concrete applications that you have in mind where you have multiple Spatial temporal processes. I just think about it. I don't know. Okay, so so we haven't thought about it. We we just thought about uh, you know the time as 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 the yeah. this time uh, sampled equally uh, even space, right? So so for for fMRI and EEG, yes, uh, but I think most of the methodology could easily extend to unequal. Yeah, what about uh, a random index model? Model. So how, how do you mean random index model? Sorry. So your index is randomly sampled uniformly from zero to one C uh, of the T domain. Um, I, I have not thought about it. Um, do you think that something would, would change? Could I just condition on this uh, yeah. randomness and then study things? Uh, conditionally on the times. I think algorithmically, like if I don't think about mathematical properties of, of these estimators, algorithmically everything should go through. Because uh, as long as I can compute this projection, I should be fine. I'll get some estimator of this projection and uh, can carry on. So then the question boils down to, can I understand how does my estimated projection score concentrate or how close is it to um, the expectation? I think if I understand that maybe. Yeah, because I'm thinking about a kind of infield asymptotics where you have fixed interval, but you sample more and more points within the, the fixed length interval. So in this case, uh, is anything change about, uh, you know, this? Uh, so so I, I know one paper from. Um, it's like a relate to the spatial kind of versions right. where you have two Different, different frameworks for, right? So yeah. for sample the spatial points, right? Yeah, so, so I, I think like the only one, one thing I'm uh, familiar with is, uh, is a pay work from Jane-Ling Wang and, and some of her students where they look at this transitioning from densely sampled yeah. uh, functional data to sparsely sampled. They kind of look at the trade-offs and how the rate of convergence changes. Um, Maybe something similar could be done in, in this uh, setting as well. But we are really assuming somehow that uh, we observe somehow densely enough number of samples. No, no, so the other reason I'm thinking about this is that because you're talking about a multimodality, right? Mm -hmm. So the spatial and the temporal resolution about uh, like FMI and EEG are very different, right? right? So the index, even though you are sample, like uh, the patient stay there for like uh, 10 minutes, mm -hmm. and then you get a different number of points, right? So for the two different measurements, how do you combine them together, right? So it's no that's reason. a good question. And I, I'm going to tell you what we did. Okay. Maybe there are better uh, kind of uh, approaches. Yeah, sure. Okay, so uh, is everyone happy with uh, kind of like this, this setting? So this is like what happens with one kind of uh, modality. And so what, what uh, our work was, you know, what, what happens when we, uh, handle multiple modalities. And so the reason, like there's some challenges with one uh, modality is by both fMRI and EEG are uh, somehow noisy measurements. They capture different physical properties of the, of the brain process. Um, there might be some confounding, for example, due to uh, like muscle movement while you are in the machine, uh, those affect the, uh, both of these uh, measurements. And then, as Xiaohui pointed out, they, they measure at different scales. So fMRI has good spatial resolution, but very poor temporal, and, and EEG lacks um, uh, spatial resolution. So our hope was that uh, maybe we can somehow combine these modalities to improve the overall uh, properties. Somehow we can uh, integrate these two modalities and, and maybe somehow improve the statistical properties of either one of these. Uh, and so um, what we kind of come up with is a, is a generative kind of representation for what we are uh, observing. So 
uh, kind of in, in reality, as, as Shahu pointed out, you know, we have, um, in this case, we will assume that we have like the same regions of interest. So we will reduce the dimensionality of f i data to represent, to be on the same number of dimensions as, uh, uh, as EEG data and a vertex will uh, correspond to one region of interest in on a graph. And then well, what you observe is like for each one of these regions of interest for fMRI, you have uh, data that looks like this. And for EG, you have something like that looks like this. And then now the, uh, the frequencies um, with a lot of energy are different. So in EG, you have very um, high frequencies and in fMRI, you have low frequencies that have uh, high amplitude. And then the way we come up with the probabilistic model for this uh, data is uh, summarized here. So this is for one vertex, for let's say uh, for one brain region, we're thinking that there's some latent process uh, that uh, we don't get to, to observe. It represents, uh, uh, well, the brain process that person exhibits while then the, in the machine. And from this um, measurement, we have some, let's say, operator that pushes forward the latent process into what we get to see. So somehow, somehow you have a, a, this latent process and you get two uh, measurements of the same process. One measurement of the latent process is called fMRI. The other measurement is um, EEG. And uh, then there's some added noise in each one of these uh, measurements. So this is somehow motivated by kind of thinking about canonical correlation analysis. So we, we, you have same object, the brain uh, function, and you get two views of this object. One view is fMRI view and the other one is EEG. This motivated somehow the, the design of the algorithm. And so for each one of the brain uh, regions, you have, uh, it's kind of like CCA probabilistic model of, of how data came to be. And then what, what we are going to try to recover is some conditional independence assumptions underlying this latent process Z. So kind of at the high level, you can think of it as a two-stage process. So we would like to identify this ZI process for each one of the vertices from uh, two measurements and then somehow learn the conditional independences from, uh, from ZI. That's kind of uh, at a high level what, uh, what we are going to, to do. We'll try to recover this latent graph. So um, what we are going to assume is that the, the latent process is somehow Gaussian, so multivariate uh, Gaussian uh, thing. Um, and then kind of relating back to uh, the Gaussian, multivariate Gaussian setting, there's a linear relationship that can relate one Gaussian, one, one kind of component of this multivariate process. It's going to be a linear combination of uh, the other processes plus some noise that is going to be independent of, uh, of ZJs. Um, then uh, the other thing that you're going to assume is that this, so this operator LM is, um, is compact operator. And what we're going to try to invert, we're going to do is we'll try to find the inverse of this operator. And in order for AM to be bounded, what we'll need to assume is that actually this LM is somehow um, finite dimensional. Only in that setting it's going to be a, so it's uh, not a tree operator or something? No. no. So the inverse has to be bounded. It has to be finite dimensional. Otherwise, it's not. No, it's essentially finite Gaussian. Yes. So, so we are kind of like, I think this is maybe uh, plausible from neuroscience perspective. There's some finite number of latent states that your brain goes through that are being captured by the by the measuring machine. So you're kind of like looking at this linear combination of the few uh, latent processes. 
so I don't know, mathematically, maybe it's not very satisfying, but I think you can always assume that, you know, this dimension could grow. The, the, you can assume, okay, it's finite, but, uh, but very large. Um, the other thing we are going to assume is that, that in some sense, these, the noise that we get to, this is noise that gets added to the fMRI OEG, it's somehow going to be small. Um, and uh, then uh, kind of like in order to use this um, relationship, we're going to essentially write our um, regression problem where you know, this inverse of LM times the apply to the Y is going to be approximately linear combinations of the other components um, when we apply the inverse math plus, uh, plus this one. And so then essentially we are going to try to solve some least square problem where we'll impose structure on the uh, A and B operators. And so at the high level, um, what we'll do is we find some um, finite dimensional representation of, of this problem. So we uh, project um, these functions onto some basis, let's say uh, FPCA basis, um, and we keep some number of uh, these coefficients. And similarly, we um, find, we approximate this operator uh, beta and A using some uh, finite dimensional uh, matrix. Okay, so that's going to be uh, what we do. And we solve the following um, kind of problem where we will be optimizing iteratively over A and B uh, matrices. Essentially what you can, you can already see that zero is a stationary point, a minimizer of this. So what we'll need is uh, the following thing. We'll need to somehow initialize this uh, alternating minimization procedure. I'll tell you how to initialize later. Uh, and we'll also need some regularity kind of uh, conditions on, on, the, on the iterates. So in particular, the A matrices, we'll simply assume that they have minimum uh, singular values bounded away from zero. So we'll be projecting onto a space where the norm is on the way from, from zero. And betas are going to be sparse. So somehow in these problems, we, can, we believe that maybe one functional, um, kind of one, one region of the brain is only affecting a few other um, regions of the, of the brain. So this, many of these BIJ matrices are going to be identical um, to zero. So we'll be performing some form of hard thresholding when we are iterating over uh, B matrices. Okay, so kind of the, the algorithm requires some tuning parameters. So we have the learning rate, uh, eta A and eta B. We have um, parameter that defines where A will be projected. So if you want minimum and maximum eigen, uh, singular value of A to be bounded away from zero and from infinity. And uh, this projection is some kind of um, hard thresholding operation on the matrices B. So only the largest, S largest, will be kept as, uh, as non-zero. Okay, so that's the uh, kind of numerical procedure that we um, investigate in the in the procedure, and it's a kind of natural extension of of works that uh, study alternating gradient, projected alternating gradient descent uh, for certain low rank um, procedures. Okay, so uh, what can we show for for this? Um, so of course we we need to assume quite a lot. The, the true parameters satisfy some structural assumptions. So the, the, the operator LM is, is finite dimensional um, and, and so forth. D 
the um, if we choose the step size of the optimization algorithm correctly, then um, you know if we run the algorithm on the previous slide and truncate uh, the solution, we'll uh, recover the edge set with, with high probability, and the convergence of this uh, optimization algorithm is is linear um, to a point that is within statistical error of the global minima. Um, what I'm going to tell you next is how do we actually initialize the solution? So somehow, where do we start A0 and B0 in this uh, iterative scheme? All right, uh, convergence is linear. Uh, your objective function is non-convex, right? Okay. So it's convergence linear basically means that uh, it's around the true parameters locally convex or it's uh... Correct, so, so that's uh, somehow what you need to show. I mean, so somehow like if, if you've seen like proofs for alternating minimization in, in multitask learning, say one example, what, what you need is you need somehow a restricted strong convexity. So in certain directions, your loss function is going to be strong, strong and convex. And you need smoothness. So meaning that the upper bound on the gradient is going to be uh, controlled. Um, so that's no, not the upper bound on the gradient, but like somehow the, the difference of the gradients at two different points, that's going to be uh, well controlled. So if you establish that those conditions hold with, with high probability, then you can kind of push through with the, with the analysis. This all relies on the analysis in a certain, um, neighborhood around the, the global uh, minima. So somehow I have to show you that you start in that neighborhood. Yes, uh, and you know how large the neighborhood is, right? So that's... Uh... It, uh, I believe it was uh, like a constant radius, but it depends on parameters, A star and B star. So the, the way we are going to initialize this is we'll run the functional uh, canonical correlation analysis. So that's going to be our initialization procedure that gives us A0 and B0. And from there on, we uh, um, then run this, this algorithm. And so the, so the, the convergence is, is linear. Um, so meaning that you know, the, the, there's a contraction between each successive- Right, line. I'm thinking about, yeah, maybe it's hidden under some assumptions. So if if you already have the sparsity patterns or something, then you sort of expect that uh, uh, around the true solution is going to be locally strongly convex. Right. Uh, but uh, in the general case, then I sort of expect uh, because the problem is non-convex, and uh, if you have kind of dense, uh, relatively dense kind of coefficients, then basically I sort of expect that that's, that's going to be sublinear rates in in general, right? So if it converges. Is any kind of phase translation if you have some kind of empirical observations how the algorithm behaves you know, in different setups? Is that a linear, you know, if you initialize far or if you change the setup? You know? So, so in, in this particular setting, we, we actually numerically, in simulations, we tried this. Mm -hmm. So uh, the algorithm is definitely sensitive to initialization. So in particular, we observe that there's no global convergence. Yeah, so if I yeah. find a bad starting point, it's not like one of these like problems where it's a benign, um, uh, like the, the, the non-convexity is somehow benign. So it's here, like you'll get stuck in the, in the wrong. Thing. So it's important to initialize well. That's like one, one observation. Um, we kind of, one, once we observed this, we did not investigate, you know, what happens when we converge, how fast they converge. I will not did we investigate how quickly we converge to a um, suboptimal uh, uh, stationary point. Okay. And the, the other thing that you know we're interested in beyond uh, kind of rate of convergence is what is the uh, statistical um, error. And so here um, you have essentially two terms. So there's a term that tells you how well you estimate the the matrix B. Um, and this is the rate you would expect from the group plus so. so. So here you have each one of the groups are roughly of the size k squared. k is the number of bases one projects latent process z and observer process y onto. 
just with simplicity, they may be different, but um, that's on order k squared. S is the number of uh, neighbors each one of the vertices in the graph has. So you have like the sparsity times k squared plus sparsity times log p divided by p. And then for matrix A, where there's no somehow special structure, your rate of convergence is essentially k squared divided by, by n. So this is the statistical rate. And so um, essentially the numerical scheme here linearly converges to uh, the neighborhood of this uh, radius. Now, uh, sharp? Uh, no idea, open question. So we, we don't have more about uh, Seemed like hairy enough that, uh, I think like the, the question of lower bounds and it is not well understood even in the one model modality case. So if I want to just study how well can I recover the structure of a functional data graphical model from you know unimodal multivariate Gaussian process, how many samples I need is it's not clear. Okay, so uh, how to initialize? So we kind of a uh, recall one of the paper from Francis Bach and, and collaborators, which is kind of thinks about probabilistic model of canonical correlation analysis and defines kind of a maximum likelihood estimator in this um, model. And uh, we leverage this when kind of the Z and uh, Xi are Gaussian, we can um, show that CCA is somehow consistent. So the idea is essentially to form this matrix R, uh, we, we look at like, let's say one region for fMRI and one region, the same region for EEG, and we can compute covariance, uh, covariance operators for, from fMRI, covariance from uh, EEG, uh, for modality one, modality two, and cross covariance between these two, two regions. And then we can uh, perform single value decomposition of this um, matrix. This will then allow us to initialize this uh, A matrix. After we initialize the A matrix, we are going to find a solution to this optimization problem uh, while keeping A fixed. And so, um, uh, again, this is going to be solved by a, a projected gradient descent. So this is a sparse solution. Um, so we project the sparse subs, uh, subspace. Okay, so uh, this is again the, the algorithm. It's an iterative projected gradient descent. Um, initialization is kind of almost consistent. So the Frobenius norm, so the error that we saw on the previous slide um, goes to zero at the, at the following rate for the A matrix. Um, so you, this comprises of two terms. This is statistical error, which depends on the gap in the singular values uh, and the truncation error. So how well our finite dimensional operator approximates the um, L. And so um, under some assumptions, we can show that initial points are going to be somehow within Bassin of retraction to the global optimum. Okay, so there are a lot of tuning parameters um, in, in the algorithm. I think five, uh, maybe six. So <laughs> we kind of provide uh, some kind of rules of thumb of how we could select this. So one, the two tuning parameters is essentially how many ba basis functions do, do we need uh, for this infinite dimensional data. And we use uh, uh, elbow method. So you can look at how well does the finite dimensional Representation approximate the, these infinite dimensional curves, and you kind of kind of increase the number of bases until um, kind of the the progress tapers off. This is what people call elbow method. So we can choose both, you know, how many eigenfunctions to keep for each modality, as well as when we are doing CCA, how many um, what's going to be the rank of the the matrix R. Then. The essential tuning parameter is the sparsity um, 
alpha, this is some another type of sparsity. It's not so important. Then tau one and tau two, uh, they keep the matrix A from either shrinking to zero or exploding. Uh, we choose using a BI secret here. So we um, run cross validation and evaluate this objective for various values of S alpha, T1, and tau one and tau two. There's no theory for what happens when we um, choose choose these in, in a data dependent way, but this is how we choose it in, in practice. Now, uh, let me show you some curves where our method beats other methods. Um, so essentially we took several um, data generating processes. The graph one and graph two, these are settings from uh, this paper Chow et al. The graph three come graph three and four come from the Zapata et al. paper. So I also have to tell you what what is, what is the state of the art. What what are the competing methods? So kind of one competing method is essentially to apply functional data graphical model for one modality, another modality, and combine the graphs somehow. That seems like a reasonable approach to do. Um, Zapata is a, another approach to estimating functional data graphical model when one assumes that uh, there is some partial separability in the function. So specifically the covariance operator for this multivariate Gaussian process has some nice special structure that can be exploited. And then there's a, a paper from folks at uh, Penn State, which essentially studied a problem of joint estimation of, of separate estimation of two functional data graphical models that somehow share the structure. So you can think of, uh, you know, fitting this uh, functional data graphical so to two data sets and somehow tying the parameters across uh, the two settings, similar to what one would do in, in a scalar setting. Um, and so what, what we observe is that you know, our method is kind of reasonably effective at uh, recovering the, the true graph in simulations. So in this setting, we, we have n to be 100. So we have 100 curves, 100 of individuals over which we uh, observe 50, 100, no, 150 curves uh, for four different settings. And <coughs> somehow we add noise to the problem. Uh, we also investigated how the procedure, our procedure, how it improves with the added sample size. So it does as one would uh, expect. Uh, and maybe this is the question that Chalquist uh, asked, which is, you know, uh, what is the rate of convergence? But this is actually a statistical uh, observation. So what we observe is somehow uh, whether the rate that we establish for the error is uh, is reasonable or, or not. So here, what, what we're observing is somehow we are changing the sample size for the problems. And so then, um, uh, we, you can think of that the sample size n for the problem is some value theta, which is sh shown, shown on the x-axis times this quantity, which is k squared times log p. And what you observe is that when sample size is large enough, you observe linear trend here uh, around the, the origin. So meaning that roughly when the sample size is enough, large enough, you have the, the error rate is predicted well by the by the theory. Okay, so, so one one left hand side and one is right hand side, right? So 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 uh, for the for the small when, when this is small that means the sample size is large. So oh. meaning that the um, for the large sample size this is the setting you you have that you know with increase of the samples the rate Kind of linearly depends on this one. Just uh, squeeze together for a large sample size, you can push a lot of large n here, right? So, so is that on the log scale is better or is it just, uh, you know? Uh... I mean, I, th I think what we did is like we, we evaluated this on the grid for, val for large values of theta. And so uh -huh. you can see that the theta changed by 0 0.05, something like that. I mean, you just, I, I think this is kind of, first of all, if I, show n here rather than rescale n, you should get a decay, then you should get like some weird, weird looking curves. I mean, it's hard to compare against the, across the settings. So this is just somehow that 
for, for different settings that the curve is somehow stacked together. They have a similar trend. But when the sample size is small, then I mean, uh, that's maybe the, the, the theory does not explain what's happening for small sample sizes. Anyhow, um, the other thing uh, that I maybe have less to say is application to, to real data. Um, we took data from Sategiani. Uh, so this was a paper where they collected this uh, uh, data while people were watching movie. So essentially you have, uh, I think something like 25 subjects. For each subject, they have two kind of experiments. So they put uh, a person one time in the machine for the first 300 seconds, they watch a movie. And then there's another 300 seconds where they do nothing. So they measure the resting state of MRI. And then they repeat this for the same individual. So for each one of the 25 individuals, you collect two times 600 seconds of, of data. And we focus on the first 300 because neuroscientists believe that uh, while one is performing a task, then the functional connectivity is similar across uh, different individuals, while in the resting state, there's quite a lot of heterogeneity between uh, different individuals. So the data needs to be pre-processed. So typically people remove few sample points from beginning and the end. One removes the trends from the, uh, one computes the, like a z-score for the, the time series, removes the uh, kind of trends, projects it onto some basis, the wavelet or, or Fourier basis, um, so these are all kind of pre-processing steps. And then we apply the algorithm uh, to, to the data. And here, if I recall correctly, uh, the, the idea is as follows. So we learn this latent representation, latent graph, and then we can refit the model on one of the two modalities. Um, and I'm not quite sure what to observe here, except that uh, maybe we get more parsimonious representation compared to if you do individual learning from each modality. What maybe numerically one can evaluate is how well the procedure does on the second experiment, because you do have this setting where you have out of sample data for each individual, you can try to predict how well you can explain the data on the second um, set. And it seems like uh, uh, a reasonable thing is done with the, with the model. Now, in the last minute, maybe I would like to say um, kind of a few things on where I'm hoping some of this research will, will go on. One thing that I'm interested in is, is thinking about effective connectivity. So rather than just looking at uh, this partial association between different regions of the brain, one uh, is scientifically more interested in causality. So uh, one way of thinking about uh, this continuous data is through a um, a model of the following form where you're having a continuous time um, differential e equation. And typically one would assume that this function f is additive in uh, different components of x. Um, and we're thinking of models of, of such form. Another kind of thing is that it is believed that while person is in a resting state, the brain goes through a number of uh, meta um, states. Um, and you would like to understand the structure of connectivity in each one of these uh, meta states. So one then thinks about hidden marker models superimposed on some vector autoregressive model or a model of this form to learn dynamic, well, switching brain uh, connectivity. Um, and then some things that uh, mathematically are, are quite interesting. Um, for instance, a lot of the work in this direction is on um, recovery of a graph. So you have an algorithm under some assumptions, you can recover the graph with high probability. But as a statistician, we all so think about quantification of uncertainty. So how, you know, certain obvi that uh, an edge between region one and region two are present in the, in the model. So how to develop you know, hypothesis tests or confidence regions for these objects is something that is not understood at this point. 
Um, thinking about how networks differ between subpopulations, so for instance, control group and group that has ADHD, understanding the, the structure of networks and the differences is something of, of interest, specifically when we have multimodal data. And then um, something that some of my collaborators are interested in is also trying to understand this functional connectivity at an individual level. So you would like to maybe cluster individuals uh, into, let's say, groups of uh, individuals that have similar pattern and have ADHD. Maybe a different subtype of ADHD uh, would be represented by a different uh, network. And so some of these questions, I think, are interesting both from statistical and maybe mathematical uh, point of view. Okay, so with that, thank you. And uh, I'm across the campus if you want to uh, chat. I guess we're a bit over time, so maybe people have, asked, have questions if you just ask. Um, what? Let's uh, thank the speaker again. Well, we can't change like a machine learning and make a.